Voodoo flossing is said to decrease pain, speed up healing, increase mobility, and even improve your performance. Let's see if there's any proof of that though. By the end of this video, you'll be able to answer the following questions. How does flossing work? Does flossing improve our rehab? Does flossing improve our performance? Are there any safety concerns? And is it worthwhile for climbers? Let's go! Let's start by looking at the mechanism or how it works. To get the benefits of flossing, you're supposed to wrap your extremity with an elastic band for a couple of minutes while performing exercises or stretches targeting that area. The overarching mechanism here is obvious, compression. Compression can cause interesting things to happen in the body. Compression on veins, capillaries, and arteries restricts blood flow. If you watched the recent Hooper's beta video on blood flow restriction training, you know this seems to enhance tissue growth under certain conditions. Also, once the bands are released, some researchers hypothesized that the reperfusion of blood to the tissue benefits healing. Compression on fascia, the thin connected tissue that surrounds muscles, creates a shearing force as the tissue moves. This breaks up adhesions in the fascia, allowing muscles to glide over each other more freely and potentially improving range of motion. Compression on specific areas of the body also alters the activity of local mechanoreceptors, which relay physical stimuli like pressure to the brain. Some researchers hypothesize that strategically stimulating mechanoreceptors could essentially override some pain signals, resulting in a decreased perception of pain. Taken individually, in a vacuum, all these factors have varying degrees of evidence as effective therapies. However, there is no evidence to explicitly show how much of a role each of them play with flossing, or if the compression of flossing is enough to even induce them in the first place. So, upon inspection, the pillars with which voodoo flossing is built are admittedly not of sand, but are certainly not of Roman concrete either. Regardless, let's see how effective voodoo flossing is in practice according to the research, and if you want to support us making these in-depth videos, hit that like button. Remember that not all research is created equal. With flossing, it's difficult to have a placebo control because it's usually going to be obvious to the participants when they do or do not have restrictive bands on them. This may make the research more prone to biased results. With that in mind, let's start our research review by trying to answer our first question. Does flossing improve our rehab? This 2021 paper studied the efficacy of flossing when added to routine treatment in patients with lateral epicondylitis compared to conventional physical therapy. Six patients split into two groups with the study lasting about four weeks. The floss group saw a change in pain from an 8 out of 10 to a 4 out of 10, whereas the control went from a 7 out of 10 to a 5 out of 10. There was also a 14 point difference favoring the floss group in relation to the PRTEE form, though this was considered statistically insignificant. Researchers' conclusion. Sample size is too small to make any bold claims, but the results indicate a positive effect from flossing. Of course the sample size is too small, but I like that this study was done over a fairly long duration and is relatable to climbers. Even if we acknowledge that the p-values weren't strong enough to make any bold claims, we can assume this was a case of it didn't hurt and maybe it helps a little. Sometimes that's a good thing. When there's a possibility of benefit without a high cost, it allows more people to try it out. Verdict. No strong evidence for or against flossing for rehabbing epicondylitis, but potentially some benefit. Let's see if there are any articles with more conclusive results. This 2020 paper studied the effects of flossing on five male recreational athletes with patellofemoral pain syndrome or PFPS for two days. Participants performed three series of jumping exercises per day while researchers measured things like jump height, jump velocity, and perceived pain. The first day involved performing the exercises and measurements before, during, and after flossing. The second day involved the same exercises and measurements, but without flossing. Between the first set and the third set of exercises, day one saw a statistically significant increase in jump height, time in air, jump velocity, jump power, and jump force, plus a statistically significant decrease in perceived pain. Day two saw no statistically significant changes. Researchers' conclusion, this study adds useful information with relation to floss band application and the reduction of pain and increased performance with those with PFPS. There are so many problems with this study stemming from a terminal lack of data and questionable study design. First, there are only five participants. Second, the study was only conducted over a course of two sequential days, with the second day meant to be the control. And without getting into too much of a rant, suffice it to say that this simply does not give us enough data to account for errors, biases, or other variables. Why did the pain start out at a four on the first day and a six on the second day? Why did jump height start at a 36 on the first day and 32 on the second? Did flossing give them such a mega workout that they were sore the next day, couldn't perform as well, and had more pain? Were they just tired from the day before? Were they excited the first day? 
Who knows? Verdict, problematic study design and lack of data throws all results into question. No strong evidence for or against flossing for rehab. Unfortunately, it looks like we're left with pretty underwhelming evidence about flossing for rehab. This study got me wondering though, could flossing improve our performance? This 2016 study had 29 male and 23 female participants. Researchers measured the effects of flossing on each participant's ankle using the contralateral ankle as the control. They measured weight-bearing lunges, plantar flexion range of motion, dorsiflexion range of motion, and jump height or performance. Measurements were taken in a single session before flossing and five minutes after flossing. Compared to the control angle, the flossing angle showed a 1.6 centimeter improvement in the weight bearing lunge test, a three degree increase in plantar flexion range of motion, a six degree increase in dorsiflexion range of motion, a 0.02 meter increase in jump height, and a 0.15 meters per second increase in jump velocity. Researchers conclusions. All results were associated with a small effect size in favor of the floss band treatment on the ankle joint, pointing to performance improvements and reduced injury risk in sports involving jumping. Whether or not the effects will last beyond five minutes is undetermined. Again, we're dealing with disconcertingly little data as the study was conducted in a single day, though the larger sample size helps offset that a bit. Overall, it seems clear that the flossing ankles saw greater increase in range of motion, at least for five minutes. However, I question their claims of improved performance. The jump height of the flossing ankle increased by about 1.57 inches, while the control ankle increased by about 0.78 inches. Without more testing in a placebo control, I don't think you can say with confidence that tiny difference was a result of a flossing and not one of many other variables. But hey, if it is a placebo effect at work, that's not bad at all. Sometimes that's the best treatment we have. Plus, they say football is a game of inches. Well, does 0.78 inches count? Verdict. Meh. Hmm. Okay, let's ask a slightly different question. Is flossing better than other techniques? This 2021 article with 80 participants broken into four groups set out to compare the immediate and short-term effects of three modalities, instrument-assisted soft tissue mobilization, tissue flossing, and kinesio taping with regard to shoulder function in amateur athletes. They used the dominant arm as their treatment and the non-dominant arm as the control group. They looked at the athlete's internal rotation and external rotation range of motion, isokinetic strength, throwing performance, and seated shot put performance. They performed these tests immediately after the treatment was applied as well as 45 minutes later. All therapeutic interventions significantly improved the strength and functional performance of the dominant shoulder in comparison to the control immediately after and 45 minutes after the treatment. Researchers conclusion, IASTM, tissue flossing, and KT taping can significantly increase range of motion, strength, and total work at both slow and fast isokinetic speed as well as the functional performance of overhead athletes' shoulders. It's unfortunate they only took their measurements for one day. What is with these one-day studies? But it's great that they had so many participants and compared multiple modalities. With no real difference in outcomes between modalities in the immediate and short term, I guess it's a personal choice whether you think that's evidence for or against flossing. Without a placebo control, we again have no reason to rule out the placebo effect. If you're curious, there actually is a different flossing study that tried to do a placebo control and they found no significant difference between the flossing and control groups. Verdict. It may or may not be the placebo effect, but flossing appears to be equally as effective as ISTM and KT for increasing some aspects of shoulder performance within 45 minutes of treatment. Okay, let's finish off our investigation by trying to get a broader perspective. It's time for a systematic review. This 2021 review included 23 articles from 2014 to 2021. They sought to summarize the latest evidence on the effect of floss band application on joint range of motion, pain, muscle tightness, strength, and performance. Range of motion. 14 out of 14 articles found no significant advantage of flossing over controls or other modalities. Four out of the six articles found improvement in ankle or knee extensor strength. Performance. Seven out of 10 articles found some kind of improvement with flossing, most of which were studying jumping. Researchers' conclusions. For range of motion, floss band application is beneficial in improving ankle, shoulder, and knee range of motion. For strength, floss band application is beneficial to enhance muscle strength, but conflicting results regarding increasing muscle activity. And for performance, floss band application could potentially lead to higher rate of force development and improve physical functional performance.
For strength and performance, it seems the evidence is in favor of flossing, though the researchers don't acknowledge the possibility of placebo effect, and based on the lackluster design of some of the other studies we looked at, I don't have a lot of confidence in that data. Verdict. Appears largely in favor of flossing for range of motion, strength, and performance, but I've become skeptical of the quality of these studies and their conclusions. In the case of voodoo flossing, we once again find ourselves in that unsatisfying gray area. But let's try to answer our original questions nonetheless. Is flossing research good? The main thing to note is how essential it is to read more than just the abstract or researcher's conclusions if you want accurate information, as these can often be oddly written and even misleading. Does flossing improve our rehab? There is some evidence in favor of flossing for rehab, even if it's just the placebo effect. However, there is not enough data to draw a strong conclusion. Does flossing improve our performance? There is some evidence to suggest increased range of motion, strength, and performance with flossing, most notably for climbers in the shoulder. However, the only data we have is for relatively short-term effects, with all studies recording measurements somewhere between 5 and 45 minutes after flossing. Note that if flossing does improve performance, it may be an indirect result from a decreased perception of pain rather than a direct mechanical or neurological effect. Are there any safety concerns? If performed correctly, it does not appear so. However, there are some contraindications, which we'll just list here. Is it worthwhile for climbers? More research is needed, but because the risk appears negligible, there's not much reason to shy away if you're interested. In general, in my practice, I won't be rushing out to tell people to buy floss bands. There are many other modalities and protocols that will assist your training and rehab effectively that have more long-term research behind them. I don't want to completely dismiss it because I'm always open to new ideas and research, but until I see better evidence, I probably won't be using it on myself either. Unless, of course, I miss the hold by uh, 0.78 inches. What do you think of all the research? Is flossing worth a try? If you have tried it, what did you find? If you think other people should see this information, please give the video a thumbs up. And until next time, train with proven, effective methods to advance your rehab and training, climb knowing you're super well-educated on these topics, send it without the Voodoo Floss magic aid, but then repeat it after having applied flossing and see if it feels easier to you. Let's start by looking at the dangerous physics behind... <laughs> <laughs>